Well, good morning, everyone. Man, it's good to see you in the house. Uh, my new friends back here, it's great to see y'all. Thank you for being here today. I want to tell you something. It's a great church. This is a great church. Uh, all week long, we've been getting reports of things that's been happening in our community. We're getting thank yous. We're getting people that saying, man, this, this series has energized me. And I, I've seen where I've been too focused upon me and too focused upon just basically the, everything that happens in the church. And my eyes are being opened that we need to be outwardly uh, looking, that our eyes need to be looking upon the outside, that our eyes need to be focused upon the, the one. Not just the 99, yes, the 99, but we need to be looking for the one. And this is the, the beautiful thing that this, uh, this series, this past series that we've just come out of, uh, we're not in that series now, but I want to remind you, this isn't just a series, this is our culture. This isn't just a, that was really weak. And if you're, hopefully if you're not watching online, there was somebody that said, you jumped off the couch, and you're like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But if, if, if this is just a series, then we just move on to something else. But if this is who we are, if this is our culture, this is something that we do every day. My, 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 what I wanted you to do last week was say, my charge to you was find someone to serve this week. Hopefully, you found someone to serve. Not just one time, hopefully you found more than more than one, more than two. So anyway, God bless you. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, there's, there's a couple things that I want to make sure that that, that we do in this house. Number one, I want us to become Bible readers. I want us to become student of, students of God's Word. I want us to understand that if we don't crack open the Bible, then it's going to be very difficult for us to experience God. It's going to be, it's going to be very difficult for us to know who He is. It's going to be difficult for us to know His character. And I want to challenge you to open up the Word of God, open up Scripture on your own, because it's not my job to tell you what the Bible says. It's my job to challenge you to get in God's Word so that God can speak to you. Many times we try to put ourselves in Scripture. What we do is we try to put our culture in Scripture. Let me tell you something this culture was not that culture. What we need to be doing is putting Scripture in us. When we put scripture in us, now we have a lens for looking at what God's word says and it challenges us and it says, okay, this is what I need to be doing. Not for you to look at it through your lens of today's culture, not to be looking at it through your lens of, of what things are today, but here's what you need to be doing. You need to be looking at scripture and saying, how can I put that in me so that I can be transformed, so that I can be changed, so that I can do what God has called me to do. It's not my job job to tell you God's, uh, God's um, will for your life. It's my job to encourage you to get in God's scripture, to get in God's word so that you will know God's will for your life. Amen? So that was free. That was just a little bonus. And, and so if you don't mind, just uh, grab your Bible right now. Hopefully you're bringing your Bibles to church and it's becoming our tradition. If you don't mind, if you're physically able to stand, I know you just sat down and that's okay. We're going to honor God's word by, by standing and reading God's word together. If you're online and you're watching at home and you're sitting on the couch, just humor me. Go find your Bible. If it takes more than 30 seconds for you to remember where it is, we have our first problem. So uh, that was just a little challenge just for you folks at home and then the folks in the room. I'm going to encourage you, bring your scripture to church with you. This is Luke 24. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. If you don't have your Bible, it will be on the screens behind me. I encourage you, bring your Bible, bring your notebook, bring your pens, because when you take notes and when you read along and you take notes, you retain. Amen? That was all free. Not even in my notes. Didn't cost you nothing. All right, here we go. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. Now that same day, two of them, them, two, two followers, two people who had been with the disciples and all of the others, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. And this is about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had just happened. And they talked and discussed these things with each other. And while they were doing that, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them on this road. 
But they were kept from recognizing that it was Jesus. And so Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still with their faces downcast. Don't pass up that too quick. Their faces were downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked Jesus, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus, he says, What things? I, just, I have to just grin when I, when I see that. It's just so interesting to me that Jesus go, what are you talking about? He's talking about them. He's talking about him. As Jesus, about, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. And this is where they stopped believing. The next three words are terrible words. The next four words, but we had hoped. We had, past tense, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels. I mean, who's going to believe that, right? Who, who said he was alive? Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Now, if you read a couple of scriptures before where I just started talking in uh, Luke 24, 11, but they didn't believe the women because their words seemed to be nonsense. Maybe, that's, maybe they should have been listening to the women. That's a good spot for the women in the room to say, yep, <laughs> amen. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that all the prophets have spoken did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus, he continued on as if he was going farther. But they said, they, they said please, or they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day's almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. Verse 30, almost done. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he began to give it to them. And when he did this, their eyes were opened, they recognized him. And then he disappeared from their sight, and they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Verse 33, last one. And they rose that same hour, they returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, gathered together, gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for your scripture. Thank you, Lord, for this word. God, it is anointed. It is powerful. Your very words that we would come to know who you are through these scriptures. I pray, God, that these words would jump off the page into our hearts and into our spirits and transform our minds today. God, that we would recognize you. That hope is standing right in front of us. I thank you, Father, for the, for the people's hearts today, their ears. I pray, God, that you would open them. Open their ears and open their hearts today, I pray. That we would experience you in your fullness. In the mighty name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you've ever heard me speak before, you know I tell a story. You know that I take a story from Scripture and then I try to unpack it a little bit. Anytime that you're hearing somebody tell a story, anytime that you're hearing somebody tell uh, you know, something from, from a book any, for, for any kind of thing, or maybe it's just something that had happened, it's always good to get context. Because if you don't understand the context, what happens before, what happens right after, you might miss the entire point. It's, a, it's kind of like you can take one snippet from what one person says, and you can put another snippet from another, and you can put it together, and you can make it, think, make, you can make it people think that they were talking about something completely different than what they were actually talking about. 
And so what I'm trying to do right now is put this in context. And so as we become Bible readers, as we become more biblical, biblically literate, as we dig into Scripture as I'm exhorting you to do here today, it helps you to know what's happening before and after. And so what I want to do is I want you to understand that at this time where this story was, is being written to us, where we're reading these Scriptures, you know, Jesus' ministry on earth, it's, it's, it's basically over. He's, he's already... He, he's, he, th- when he's already been crucified, he's already, he's already been risen from the, from the grave, he's already been resurrected. And at this time in Passover, I want you to understand that many times we look at Hollywood's versions of what's happening uh, when we see these kind of events on, on movies that we watch. I don't know that any of them has ever depicted Jerusalem for what it actually looked like at that time. We, we never see a, like thousands and thousands of people there in any of the movies that I've ever seen. I need you to understand that at that time, the population of Israel was, was uh, about 2 million. Uh, most scholars believe in Josephus when you read external sources. When you read these things and you say, okay, there's about 2, two million people in Israel altogether. And could there have been up to a million people, as some says, in Jerusalem at that time. So half the population all gathered for one reason, and that's Passover. So many people saw what happened. Like more than we can even imagine. If you ever go to Israel and you see the Pool of Siloam, and you see the vastness of it, and you see how huge it is, there's a reason why that pool's so big. It's because pilgrims came from all over Israel and all over the region, and they all must have uh, uh, been immersed, uh, uh, baptized. They baptized themselves. They, they immersed themselves in the pool before they walked up to the temple. They had to. And so we know that many, many people, Jerusalem swelled in, in size at the time of these feasts, and especially at time of Passover. And, and so all had heard by this time all of the miracles and all of the things that Jesus had been doing in the Galilee were up to 95 to 98% of his ministry happened in this little quadrant up in this northwest corner of, 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 the, of the Sea of Galilee. Many, many people, they're all talking about at this time, all the miracles, the, the blind eyes that's been opened, all of the things that they've seen and witnessed. Many, like thousands of people, 5,000, they are talking about how the, the, the loaves and the fishes and all of the miracles, that that's the buzz of what's happening in Jerusalem at this time, right before when this, this happened. So people are talking about the Sermon on the Mount. They're talking about all of this in Passover. And by this time, almost everyone had heard. Thousands saw him die. Not a few. Thousands saw it happen. Many people, they're talking about what's going on. Like, because, and the reason why for this is because they, we don't have the internet. We don't have... We don't have social media. We don't have the news. We don't have all of this going on. But people, God needed it to happen like this because the people that left that region, now they take it to all of the regions in which they live. This is the context of what's happening in this scripture of what we just said. So Jesus, he's already died. And at the end of Luke, at the end of Luke's gospel is the beginning of hope for us. Have you ever thought about it like this? That at the very end of Luke, we find hope. I love all the rest of it, and I'm not minimizing the birth and the ministry of Jesus and and the teachings of Jesus and all this. It's all important, but I can tell you this. I'm not minimizing that importance, but without the death, without the burial, and without the resurrection, there is no hope for us today. And aren't you thankful that we have hope because he's alive? Because wherever people are, we, we know this, but wherever people are, current events are being discussed uh, this is just the same way it happened then as it is now. Nothing's different in the first century. Uh, uh, men and women, they're talking, and, and uh, we've got uh, religion and politics being discussed, and barber shops and beauty shops, and at the city gates, this is where all of these discussions are happening. All right? You know that, Janet, don't you? You got, you got your beauty shop. So everybody's talking about the current events. That's exactly what's happening in this day, in the first century, just like what's happening today. People's talking about Masks, no masks, the numbers rising and all this stuff. It's the same as it was then, okay? A lot of things run parallel. 
And what makes it even more difficult for us to understand sometimes is politics and religion were the same. Politics and religion in this day, they were the same. So we need to understand that in Scripture in first century times. And so here's what, here's what people was discussing. Can you believe what we just saw? Can you believe what just happened? I mean, do you agree with what Pilate did? Can, I think he's a lunatic. Can you believe that they let Barabbas go? Can you believe that, 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 that he, he wasn't the one that was chosen? Can you believe they just let him off scot-free? They pardoned him. I mean, this is what they're talking about in the, along these days. It's hard to understand what's happening unless we understand a little bit about what's going on. So, here's what it sounded like when they're talking to Jesus. I can't believe that you haven't already heard. I can't believe that you don't already know. Well, I mean, where have you been? Living in a tomb? I mean, this is probably the way they were thinking. And it's, you know, this is probably how they were thinking. Have you been living in a cave? I mean, how did you not know? Everybody's talking about this. I mean, it's all over Facebook. It's all over. Man, Jesus, how do you? Listen, they don't call him Jesus. They didn't know who, who he was at that time. They weren't expecting him. They bring Jesus up to speed. They reveal all of these things that we had hoped. There's somebody in the room today, and I'm talking to you whether you're online or in this room. You showed up today without hope. You showed up today because you had hoped. That's where these two guys are. Because you see, when you had hoped in your mind, it's over. When you had hoped in your heart and in your spirit, you're, you're downcast. When you had hoped in your mind and you thought something was going to happen, you thought you was going to get a job, you thought everything was going to be okay, you didn't expect somebody to walk out on you, you had hoped. But today in your spirit, you are downcast. Maybe that's you today. Is there anybody here that you have ever been to the point where you were losing hope? Hope is when you expect God to do it. Hope is when you not just expect, you have faith He's going to come through for you. Hope is when you believe your future will be different than your yesterday. Hope is when you say, I believe the Scriptures to say that what God says, I believe the promises and they're mine. This is what hope is. See, we know God can, but many of us, we lose faith that He'll do it for us. We hear others get reports and others get wonderful things happen to them. And somehow, I don't know why, but we lose hope. See, Psalms 42.5 says this. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. Not what you saw, because we don't walk by, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Don't look at what you, what, what you see with your earthly eyes and just think that's the way it's going to end. No, we got to put our hope in God, according to Psalms 42. If you're walking with God and you lose hope, you become miserable. I know some miserable Christians. They've been walking with God for a long time, but they're just miserable because they've lost hope. Hope. Look what Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and his hope is in God. Put your hope in God. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, for which spreads out its roots by the river. And will not fear when heat comes, but its leaves will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Hope. Hope is what holds us together while we're waiting. Hope is what will hold us together while we're waiting. Everybody needs some hope. Life has a way of draining us from hope. Life has a way of every single day something could be happening. You could take you down a hard road. Life has a way of draining us of that hope. Don't forget that hope is what holds us together while we're waiting to see the breakthrough. Amen? The events over the last few weeks that we have witnessed this is an expression of people with no hope. The events that we have seen unfold and we see it on our, on our evening news, this is people that have no hope. They're desperate with no hope. Because when we have hope, when our hope is in the Lord, when we trust in Him, 
Our feet are on solid rock. Obviously, today, there's a lot of folks whose feet are not on solid rock. I need some folks, I need some people to understand that I've come to declare the Lord to you today that if we put our hope in God, there is no other hope except for Jesus Christ. And I came today to declare this word to you so that you would understand. If you walked in here with no hope, I want you to know where to look for hope because Jesus is standing right next to you. And sometimes we don't, we don't see him. Sometimes we don't expect him. We don't even recognize him. Just like these two guys, they didn't, re they didn't realize that hope was standing right next to them. And I want to tell you that hope is not too far away from where you're standing right now see the Lord showed up to these guys to give them hope again the Lord went running after them to show them that there is hope they left a little too soon so this is the way three hope three ways hope dies and I've got it on the screen for you. I hope you're going to take some notes. If you're watching online, th this is going to go real quick. I want you to understand, I I've laid all this out here to go real quick through these three things. These are three ways that, hopes die that hope dies. When you quit expecting him to show up. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says they did not recognize him. In Luke 24, 15 and 16, look at this. As they talked and discussed these things with each other. So they're talking, they're mully grubbing. They're downcast according to scripture. Their faces are down. They're probably kicking rocks as they walk the seven miles to Emmaus. They're probably very down in their spirit. And then what happens? Jesus shows up. Man, if you're downcast today in your soul, if you're downcast today in your spirit, lift your head up and put your shoulders back and say, I know that God is with me and because he's with me, I can face today. And because he's with me, I can face tomorrow. This is what Jesus does for us. And then when, when we're downcast, when our souls are downcast and we don't know what we're going to do tomorrow, it's time to put your eyes on Jesus. It's time to realize that hope is not standing too far away. As they talked, and as they discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked right along beside them. Somebody, and that's good news for somebody today. That no matter where you are, Jesus, he's going to show up. If you're downcast in your soul, he's going to walk right beside you and he's not going to let you go. He's going to hold you in, your hand, in his hands. He's going to say, Dana, it's going to work out. It's going to be okay. Keep your eyes on me. Don't put your eyes on situations. Don't put your eyes on men. They'll let you down every time. Keep your eyes on Jesus. They were standing next to hope. But they had no hope. Maybe it's because they weren't expecting him. Last week, on Saturday, I got a phone call early. Emma Watts was just, I mean, she was, she had been taken by ambulance to, to, to Mercy. She, her, her daughter reached out to me, Nicole reached out, and she says, Pastor Darren, we need to pray right now. So I, I prayed with her. I called Lonnie, her husband. And we prayed right then. I called, <laughs> I, I called everybody in the family and had just prayer, because that's about the only way I can pray with folks now. We, we just have to pick up the phone. It's an old-fashioned way, and we just, that's what don't, I can't go to the hospital. None of our team can go to the hospital. You know how it is right now. And so we just called one by one and just prayed, the, 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 just faith that God is going to hold Emma in his hands and, and heal her. And she, she has a, a shunt in her, in her brain, and for whatever reason, it was filling up with fluid, a whole lot like Bayre, uh, is situation. Paul, I'll see you on, on, on uh, the sound today, and God bless you for being here, buddy. We're standing with you, my friend. We're standing with you. We're believing that God is going to touch her. And so we prayed that prayer for Emma. And, and I can tell you that later in the afternoon, it got darker. I got another phone call. They're having to take her to UAMS to do emergency surgery. They're taking her via ambulance right now. So we prayed again. We, we got the whole prayer team. We, we got everybody on board. with it. We need to stop what you're doing. We need to pray right now. Many of you on the prayer team, you, you were praying for that situation. And they said they were going to do emergency surgery that night. And I can tell you this, in the, in, in the Watts' household, there was a little bit of doubt. A li they needed some hope. They needed to know that Jesus was standing right there with them. They needed some people to gather around them. In the time of COVID, we can't gather around. So we just do it via phone call. And this is what happened. 
I called late that evening, late Saturday evening. I said, have they done the surgery? I haven't heard. I just can't go to bed until I know. They said, no, I, I, we didn't hear anything, and the doctors haven't called us back, and I guess they'll do it tomorrow. So we sleep, and we pray again. Carrie and I, we prayed for them, and, and, and the prayer team was praying. All I know is this. The next morning, I'm driving to church, and I said, Nicole, I can't get up on that platform until I know what's going on. I, I, it's just on my mind. I got I to gotta, I gotta know. Anybody you ever just had to know? <laughs> We just needed a phone call. We just needed to know what's happening. And I hope you're sitting on the edge of your seats because I know this. At that time, they still had not done the surgery, and they still didn't know. So I'm, I'm praying, and I'm praying all the more. And I, normally, if you text me about a minute before I walk up here, I'm not going to look at my phone. Many of you, you text me while I'm standing here like I'm going to, you're in there. You're, like you're, you're right in front of me, and you text me while I'm here like I'm going to look at the phone and answer you right now. So don't do that, Cindy. You got your phone out. I saw you do that. But for whatever reason, the Spirit of God moved upon me and said, look at your phone. I did. I read it. And it said, Pastor Darren, there's been a miracle. Mom doesn't have to have surgery after all. That God has touched her. And we know that this is a miracle. All I know is this. She don't have to have surgery now. Dad's on his way. To pick her up right now. Well, man, I got excited. I, from that point to right here, I, I, I babbled on for about four or five minutes before I could even get into God's Word. But I was excited. Why was I excited? Because I prayed. I had expectation. I knew that God was going to stand there with her. I knew that Jesus was going to show up in the middle of my downcast heart. I knew in the middle of all of that, that hope was standing right next to my dear friend, Emma. Now, when you hear that word today, that should excite you. The reason it should excite you is this. Because expectation rises up in our heart when we hear that Jesus shows up. Expectation rises in our hearts and expectation that, that we can't understand. And, and, and uh, let me tell you something. Bayree, we're expecting something good to happen. Johnny Cole, you're watching at home online right now. We expect something good to happen. We have an expectation. Linda Stouffer, we expect God to continue to minister to you. I've written some names down. Myrtle Sutton, we're praying. Paul McFadden, we're expecting. Stan and Cheryl, we're standing with you. There's some people right now that we have to understand. They're within our midst, and they're hurting and their souls could be downcast. And I brought a word to, to, to you today that says, hey, one way that hope dies is when we lose expectation. I sent out a text last night to Tanya and Ben's story, and I said, I hope you're ready for church tomorrow because I have an expectation that God is going to show up, that he's going to meet people's needs, and I'm going to come with an expectation. If you walk in this house and you have no expectation to meet with God, you'll probably get what you came expecting. But if you show up expecting God to meet your need and you come expecting that these words will come alive in your spirit, and if you come to this house and you come expecting to meet with him, I promise you, you'll meet him every time. Can I push it? I only had two cups of coffee this morning, not the three. Last week I got a little loose. So we went with the two cups. If you come to this house and you come expecting, you go, oh, that's not the guy I expected to hear. You probably get what you came expecting. Look, come every time, no matter who's standing here, no matter who is, who's delivering the word of God, it's been an excellent word every single week. When you walk in here, you should be encouraged in the Lord and you're receiving the, the, the word of the Lord that should energize you and get you ready to go out into the world to do what we're to, to do what we're called to do and that's to be salt and light it's good when the 99 gather but man we got to get this thing out to the one yeah I'm fixing two thank you Sean three ways hope dies is when you quit expecting him to show up number two it's when you remove yourself from the body of Christ now, these, these two guys, they left Jerusalem. They were with all of the believers. They should have stayed in Jerusalem with all of the other believers, but yet they left Jerusalem. The problem is the worship was happening in Jerusalem. 
The problem is the body of Christ was in, the, the collective body of Christ, the church was in Jerusalem. They left with no hope. We had hope. They didn't believe what the women said because, you know, you can't believe anything women say anyway, right? Now, that's not true. They should have had hope when they saw that that tomb was empty. When they heard that that tomb was empty, they should have had hope. They should have believed, they, but they did not. You see, they left the disciples, they left the upper room, they, 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 they left the body of Christ, they left the worship, and the worst thing you can do, I want you to hear me, the worst thing you can do when you're losing hope is to separate yourself from the body of Christ. Now, I know these are unprecedented days, and I want you to hear my heart. I'm so thankful that we have a, a great team here that can bring the Word of God to those that don't feel comfortable coming here. And if you're sick, I, you know, please, you need to stay home. If you're old, please, you need to stay home. If you don't feel comfortable you know, being here, that's, that's fine. That's why, we, that's why we have what we have with, with our online experience, okay? But here's my concern. My concern is it's going to be very difficult for you to really experience life change and transformation and the presence of God if you're standing in the kitchen with it over here and it's barely on and you're doing the, the, the eggs and the bacon. That's fine. But let me, let me say this. You might need to create a different atmosphere in your home while church is happening to experience life change you might have to do some things different if this is the way we're going to continue for the long, for the long term because this is, I, I believe we're not going to get out of this like in, in, in the next 30 days. When you leave the body of Christ, I please hear my heart. If you're, on, if you're watching online, I love you. I'm glad you're watching online. But create an atmosphere in your home that says, hey, right now we're going to have church. Right now, we're going to turn everything else off. Right now, kids, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to look at God's Word. We're going to teach. We're going to, we're going to listen and hear what God has to say. We're not just going to let this be a casual experience. This is God's time in which we're gathered and we're not going to leave. This is the way I believe that we can come together and make this moment even better. The worst thing we can do is leave church when, when our fears are being emboldened. Because when, what happens is, when you leave the presence of the Lord, we know this, hope starts to die. When you leave the presence of God, hope starts to diminish. And I'm thankful for online church. I said that three times already. I want you to hear it because I know what people do. They only hear what they want to hear. No, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that you're tuning in right now. I'm thankful that you're watching maybe on Thursday. Maybe, it, maybe that's the only time that you can do it. I'm thankful for that. But what we need to do is understand that this casual experience will not produce something that's going to be radically changed in our hearts and in our spirits. Got one, one amen from that. I didn't expect that to just go crazy. But the worst thing we can do when we lose hope is to remove ourselves from the body of Christ. If you've lost hope, do whatever you can. Make sure that you can tune in. Make sure that you can be here. If you've lost hope, listen. If you can go to Lowe's, and I saw some of you last week, then you can be here, and I'm looking at some of you. I saw y'all, and you're here, thank God. But if we, can, if we can play travel ball on the weekend, we can get to church. If you get your mask, don't pass, go put, collect $200, just get here, Javier. I'm just glad to see that everybody that we're here. I'm telling you, we need to experience God together, and we need to be together to do this. It's hard right now. I get it. I'm, it's like... It's so hard for me to understand there's really, there's two audiences. There's really three because kids are in the room. Hey, I see Paxton this morning. I meet my little buddy Paxton over here. He's brand new. First time he's here today. He can't even see over the rail. Can't even see me. How you doing back there, Paxton? Glad you're here. We got, that's why we have these little things that we have for our kids. So it will go right along with the word of God. We have sang a song. It says, I'm believing for a victory, right? Well, the first page, you open it up, it says victory. We're trying to coordinate the things that we're doing so we can be even more effective even during all of this time. That The kids in the room, we realize we can't have uh, you know, kids ministry and we're, the teams, we're looking at how we can reopen that and all of that kind of stuff. We're looking at all of that. But I want you to know, during this time, we've got to come together somehow. We have to figure out a way that we come near the body of Christ. That not only we tune in, 
but that we set aside some time, that we set aside this space. It's not just this extra thing that we do. No, this is the time where we are together as one, the body of Christ. Because when you stop, when you stop getting in God's Word, the wrong voices start speaking to you. When you stop getting into God's Word, the wrong motives will come and be demonstrated in your life. These are the things that happens when hope starts to die. Three ways that hope dies. Number one, when you quit expecting Him to show up. Number two, when you remove yourself from the body of Christ. This is what happened to these guys. And number three, when you give up too soon. Look at what happened. Look at this. Verse 21. But we had hoped. We did hope, but we don't now. That he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. There's even a certain political thing that's happening at this very moment. In the scripture right here. They were looking for a political savior. And let me tell you something right now. This isn't a political statement. This is a scriptural statement. If you're looking for anything other than Jesus Christ and God himself to take care of things. If you're looking for a political savior. I'm going to tell you you're going to be completely disappointed because there's not one. There was people in that day looking for Jesus to save them now. Under Roman rule and Roman oppression. You think you got it bad, baby? Let me tell you something. Ain't nobody experienced these things like they experienced them. They were under the thumb of Roman rule. And they said, I wonder if he's the one that's going to be our redeemer. Our political redeemer. This is what was happening in scripture. If you don't know that, I challenge you to dig in further to get context Jesus Christ is the only hope that we have he's the only hope that we have and today he's standing next to you and if you've lost hope I want you to look at hope right next to you because he said I'll never leave you I will never forsake you and because he said that I choose to believe that that's true. I choose to believe that these difficult days that all of us are walking through, that we can't be with our loved ones who are in retirement homes and nursing homes, and we can't be with them, my heart goes out to them. But hope is standing nearby. His name is Jesus. They left Jerusalem on the third day. They quit on the third day, right before, right before they knew something should be happening, according to Scripture. They left before the miracle. Listen to this. The resurrection is the foundation for every promise of God. The resurrection, that is what makes everything else come to life. Because I can tell you this, the resurrection, because of the resurrection, we can trust everything else that this thing says. The Word of God is true. And because of the resurrection, we are different than every other religion in the world. Did you not know that Buddha is dead? Did you not know that he's still in the grave? It's the thing, the resurrection is the thing that says we have a promise and it's true. It's become fulfilled. And because of that, we are different. Muhammad is dead. He's still in the grave. Joseph Smith is dead. He is still in the grave. But Jesus Christ, he has been resurrected. And he is alive. And he is hope to every person that wants to draw near to him. My time is up and we got to get out of here. But we got to give the, the cleaning crew a time to, that they can clean all this up. But as I wrap this thing up, as I wrap up, I want to ask you some questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead? Amen? Do you believe that? If you do, every other promise in this book is true. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then I understand why you have no hope. But if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you must have hope today. And I've come by to tell you these things so that you would be able to walk out with a newfound hope. You say, Brother Darren, Pastor, I, I need some good news today. His name is Jesus. 
You say, Pastor Darren, I need a, a good report today. His name is Jesus. You say, Pastor Darren, I need to know that he's still with me. He'll never leave you. His name is Jesus. And because of the resurrection, we have hope. Don't give up too soon. Look at what he, I'm going to give you one more passage. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Their eyes were open. Our eyes will be open. They were open when, when they talked to him. No. They were open when he talked to them. We got to get in the word and allow the word to speak to us. And you say, there's, Pastor Darren, I've never experienced this time like this, like I am right now. It may be because you haven't opened the scripture and allowed him to talk to you. We might need to listen to his words. They knew the scriptures. These guys, they're, they're Jewish guys. They're, they, they knew the scriptures. But they didn't understand the scriptures the way Jesus opened up the scriptures to him, to them. What we don't need is a new revelation. <laughs> what we need is a fresh application to the old revelation. That's what we really need. We need to know that we have hope. He's standing right next to us. And we don't need to look for some brand new teaching or some new theology. It's right here. And if, until we open this up, until we understand what this says, we may not have hope. Our eyes were open. Look what this says. When our hearts will burn. What that means is when, when, when their hearts burned within them, it was a new, fresh understanding of the old revelation that they had already have you ever read something and it didn't make sense but then you read it later and it made complete sense this is what happened when he opened the scriptures to them what we need is a fresh opening of scripture they had a partial understanding of scripture and this is my concern today is that we have just a partial understanding of God's word and that's why at the beginning of this sermon, I, I challenge you to open up Scripture. I challenge you to dig further. I, we need to become more biblically literate. So when, when difficult times come, we understand what Scripture says. And we can stand in difficult days. With every head bowed, every eye closed in this place today, I want to ask you a couple questions. You see, God speaks hope. He speaks encouragement. And He does it through Scripture. Worship songs are great to sing. I get that. And I think that we should be worshiping. But if you don't know Scripture, you're going to be left in a desolate desert. We must open up the Word because the Word is important. It shapes our minds. The Word shapes our emotions. The Word shapes our feelings. And it's time to get in His Word. And in times like these, we need more hope and more Scripture than we've ever had. Because we are the light of the world. So my questions to you in these moments while nobody's looking around. Your heads are bowed. A moment that we reflect. The three ways that hope's die, hope dies is when you quit expecting Him to show up. Are you expecting Him? Are you coming with an expectation to meet with Him every time we assemble together? Whether it be in the room or online. Are you experiencing His word do you have a daily time of scripture that you, that you listen to the Lord where you stop, where you just read and you stop and you reflect and hear what he's saying to you? Moms and dads, are you leading your family? You can't lead your family till you're leading yourself first. This is a difficult time right now in which we all live, but as a family, We've got to be leading our kids. We've expected the church to lead our kids for us. And now it's difficult for us to even lead ourselves. And now my concern, my greatest concern is, is that our kids are falling behind, not just at school, but they're falling behind in Scripture because we don't know how to lead them. We are inadequate to lead them because we're not even leading ourselves. I feel like this is just something inside me that we need to be leading our kids through this time to where they're not fearful. They pick up on everything that we say. So my question is, are you in God's word every day? I'm not gonna have anybody raise any, any hands right now because this is difficult. 
No one's looking around. I'm just asking you questions and you're already answering them in your mind. You know the answers. The children in this room are very, very valuable. To Jesus' heart, suffer the little children, let them come to me. We need to be taking Scripture to them. Take Jesus to them. Take hope to them. Let me pray for you today. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. I ask you, God, that every person that walks into this place today, God, that they would experience your hope again. That they would experience the freshness of the realities and the revelation that is in your word. That when we understand and we know your word, God, that you will come alive to us again. And that you will follow us along the road of life just like you did these two guys on that road to Emmaus. I thank you, Father, for your word today. Help it to change us. Lord, let it change us in our spirit and change us for our tomorrow. That tomorrow we will dig in in your word. And if we have kids, we will lead our kids according to your scripture. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.